Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the sixth annual meeting of the Soil Health Institute. My name is Wayne Honeycutt, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president and CEO of the Soil Health Institute. We're really excited today to bring the community together over the next couple of days, actually. Uh, you may be as amazed as we are that uh, we've had over 2,200 people register for this event from over 1,300 organizations in 67 countries. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is that we have over 150 farmers that have registered to attend, uh, representing some 685,000 acres. So recognizing that uh, with this breadth of audience, it might be the uh, first time that some of you uh, have become aware of the Soil Health Institute. So I'll just give you just a very, very brief uh, rundown of the Institute. Uh, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we work to safeguard and enhance the vitality and productivity of soils. So we do that through a number of ways, a number of avenues, uh, things like in our research area. We have strong research programs like in the microbiome and carbon measurement, uh, assessing certainty of those carbon measurements. Uh, we also have a lot of work on identifying the most effective measurements for soil health and then recommending those for farmers and ranchers and other practitioners to use. Uh, we have a strong program in the economics of soil health, also a farmer education and training program where we set up farmer to farmer networks. We work to quantify the impacts of soil health on things like on productivity and environment, things like greenhouse gas emissions and water quality. Uh, we also try to help make sure that policies are well informed. Uh, and then we have a program for educating consumers because really what we wanna help do is drive more market demand for food and fiber and fuel uh, that's grown using these soil health systems so that we can really expand in these environmental benefits that the soil health management systems can bring uh, to all of society. So uh, our theme over the next two days, uh, this year's annual meeting uh, is enriching soil, enhancing life. Um, when we thought about our theme for this year's meeting, that, that really stuck with us. It really resonated with us. And I think it's because when you enrich soils, you really do enhance life. It's so many different levels, uh, from the microscopic level to the ecosystem level. Just kind of one example, just to kind of make my point, uh, just take one measure of soil health, soil organic carbon. Of course, there's many different measures of soil health, but soil organic carbon is kind of one of the most universal measures. Of course, when we increase the organic carbon in the soil, we are many doing many things other than just increasing it. We're not only taking the excess carbon out of the atmosphere for storing it in soils, but when the microbes feed on those soils as, as their energy source, then they in turn release things like nitrogen and phosphorus for plants. And so of course they're enhancing plant life. And then, of course, that's, you know, people like us and other animals, the four-legged animals, too, uh, they benefit from that. So it enhances their lives. But also, we know that when we increase carbon in storage in soils, then we can build the available water holding capacity in those soils. And so what that does, of course, is uh, build drought resilience. And, of course, now think what that means to the livelihood of the farmer and his or her ability to put their kids through college. Uh, and of course, we all know that our lives are also enhanced because now through that drought period, we are still able to have a plentiful supply of affordable, nutritious food that, you know, that benefits all the rest of us, and therefore enhancing our lives. But, you know, when that drought resilience, it not only uh, increases the economic viability for farmers, but then what that helps them do, of course, is sustain these rural landscapes that we all love and enjoy. And of course, another way of enhancing our lives. And I think it's important that we also don't forget that those rural landscapes, um, they really help sustain the habitat for wildlife. Those, those other creatures on the, this earth uh, which we, with which we share, and therefore we have a responsibility to, quite frankly. And so there are so many connections between uh, enriching soils and enhancing life. And uh, I just wanted to kind of share that perspective. And I think it's actually kind of a, a perfect introduction also uh, for our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Moore McDonald, because I've known Moore for many years and have always marveled really, quite frankly, at, at how she 
not only lives, but works at this nexus of the environment and agriculture. And you know that these just these are not incompatible goals of being able to produce food and fiber and also have a good, clean, uh, healthy environment for us and the, not only us, but the generations that come after us. These are not incompatible goals. And that's just, you know, one of the, uh, uh, I think the mantras and opportunities for soil health is that it's one of those rare win-win situations where we can not only do good things for the farm and the ranch and the farmers and ranchers, uh, but also uh, for the environment and, and the rest of society. And so I've known more to, to work at that nexus uh, for many years. Uh, so we were just really just delighted that she agreed to be our keynote speaker. So uh, with no further ado, I will just uh, very quickly introduce Maura. She's uh, uh, currently uh, the director of the environment program for the Walton Family Foundation. For the last 12 years, she's led the foundation's Mississippi River and Coastal Initiatives, focusing on sustainable agriculture and coastal resilience. She has more than 25 years experience uh, in wetlands and freshwater conservation. And she previously managed the uh, Mississippi River and Great Lakes program for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So I uh, turn it over to you, Maura. Thank you, Wayne, for that kind introduction. It's a real honor to participate in the annual meeting of the Soil Health Institute, for, um, which brings together so many <clears throat> dedicated professionals working on the important topic of how to protect and enhance our soil. It's a privilege to be able to hear from the leading voices and to learn about the new research insights that are transforming the way we grow our food. And it's just a pleasure to be able to join so many grantees and partners and good friends as we work together to advance sustainability and conservation. Um, I remember the first time that Wayne and Bill Buckner came to my office to discuss the Soil Health Institute. Um, like Wayne said, it was many years ago. I, I'm thinking maybe seven, not totally sure. I think Wayne and I both looked better than Bill, of course, is ageless and so still looks wonderful today. I was just struck by the vision they had. They had an idea for a farmer-led science-forward organization that would bring attention to the need and opportunity around soil health. And many years and a few grants later, I can't believe how the organization has grown and what, uh, how it's a part of such a burgeoning movement. And I'm so proud of everything that you guys have accomplished at the Soil Health Institute. And I'm so honored to have been um, along on the ride for such great learning and experimentation with Wayne and the team. So um, to start here, um, at the Walton Family Foundation, we focus on protecting rivers and oceans in the face of climate change. And because agriculture is the single largest user of water worldwide, about 70% of freshwater withdrawals are for farming. Improving how farmers interact with water is at the center of our work. Whether it's issues of more intense and frequent storms in the Midwest causing soil loss and nutrient loss that contributes to the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, or the drought and overuse of water in the West this, that is stressing farmers and ecosystems alike, the role that farmers can play in improving soil and water outcomes is at the very center of the work that we do to protect rivers and oceans. We put farmers at the core of our work because we believe that they're best positioned to find and test effective solutions for our environment and our economy. We connect that work we do with farmers, with NGOs, private companies, and even governments who share the belief that we can work with nature to meet the pressing challenges of our moment. Those cross-sector sector partnerships are critical because the stakes are really high. Uh, just this week, the scientific community doubled down on the consensus that the climate is changing faster and more dramatically than we had previously predicted. And we're already seeing the impacts of climate change every day as temperatures rise, as extreme weather events become more frequent, and as ecosystems shift. These changes are affecting our water resources and, of course, our agricultural systems. They're imperiling livelihoods across the country and around the globe. And as time goes on and world population grows, we'll have to work even harder at doing more with less to sustain our agricultural and food systems. It's clear that we're facing a transformation in the way that we interact with the environment. 
The question is when and how we're going to respond. We can be proactive or we can choose to wait. Um, if we choose to do nothing, we face the risk of disrupting our ag and food systems and further damaging our water resources. But if we choose to act proactively, we think we can help set an agenda for a more resilient food and ag future. And we at WFF, we at the Walton Family Foundation, think that we need to recognize the challenges ahead of us to apply cutting edge research and adjust our agricultural practices to maximize efficiency and to reduce our environmental impact in order to create the conditions for people and nature to thrive together. That will involve emphasizing solutions that are scalable. It will demand effective policies and smart innovation to deliver sustainable results. And it will require a collaborative effort with industry, government, and communities. So how do we do it? Well, I have four steps for you. First, we need to start by rejecting the idea that what's good for the environment is bad for the economy. We know that conservation practices promote soil health, reduce erosion, and improve crop yields, all outcomes that protect and strengthen one of farmers' most valuable assets, their land. And we know that practices like reduced tillage and cover crops can, over time, pay economic dividends for farmers. Yet, most people still assume that conservation and profit are diametrically opposed. We believe that the choice between profitability and conservation is a false one. Ultimately, a strong economy and a sustainable environment go hand in hand. And taking care of the planet means that it will help take care of us too. Second, uh, we need to deliver effective lasting policies. Many of the nation's agricultural policies are frankly old, and they were designed at a time when the impact of climate change wasn't being clearly felt. They were designed at a time when the global economy looked fundamentally different, and finally, when equity was not part of the conversation. We should adjust federal agricultural policies to address these issues and support farmers who reduce their production risks through conservation practices, aiding producers, the environment, and taxpayers all at once. We have good data that suggests that farmers who use soil health practices, again, like reduced tillage and cover crops, are actually less risky, and that healthy soil is more resilient to weather challenges that climate change is making more common, as Wayne mentioned about drought in the introduction. Yet our agricultural policies discourage farmers from innovating with conservation practices. Farmers shouldn't be penalized for doing the right thing, and they shouldn't have to overcome barriers to try good practices. Instead, policies should be updated to serve farmers' best interests, taking into account the new risk posed by climate change, while recognizing that farmers should be rewarded for being part of the solution. The third step to a more resilient future is that we need to spur smart innovation. Conservation shouldn't be about what people can't do. It should be about what people can do. To be human is to be uniquely adaptive, and I think that is doubly true for farmers. Rising to the challenge of the moment will require innovative solutions that build sustainable economies and resilient communities. In some cases, that means turning to natural solutions like building soil health to improve yields and reduce water pollution. In other cases, we can leverage technological advances to make it easier to integrate conservation into farming operations. This can look like new equipment that makes it easier for farmers to seed cover crops into standing corn, or it can be ways that, that make it easier and cheaper for farmers to access remote sensing data that can help them manage their operations more efficiently. These advance and advances sorry, lessen our ecological impact and also improve our profit margins, winning for farmers and winning for the environment. Finally, we need to ensure that our actions take into account the diverse range of communities that interact with our natural resources. Climate change is a global phenomenon, but the impacts are felt at the local level. That's why the conversation about climate change needs to involve frontline communities, especially those that have historically been excluded from the dialogue. 
we need to bring impacted commu communities to the table from the people who work with nature um, every day, like farmers and ranchers, um, to the people who are disproportionately impacted by climate change because of where they live, like communities facing an increased risk of flood, hurricane, or drought. At the Welton Family Foundation, we believe that those, are closest, that those closest to the problem often have the best solutions. And we intend to do our part to ensure that the voice of impact communities is not just heard, but heeded. By bringing more people to the table, we believe that we can do more to, to develop community-driven and culturally relevant solutions and advance our overall success. Here's the reality. The challenges that we're discussing at this annual meeting are not easy to address. They'll require hard work and resilience, collaboration and creativity. I have no illusions that we'll solve them overnight, but I have no doubt that through the work of extraordinary individuals like those taking part in this conversation and with the help of our partners and allies across the country and around the world, we can make transformational and durable progress. We can enrich our soil and enhance our life. And we can ensure a more resilient, productive, and equitable future. Thank you once again for inviting me and for hosting this great meeting. Thank you for your tireless efforts to um, feed our communities and strengthen our agricultural systems. And I look forward to what we will continue to achieve together in the days, months, and years ahead. Thank you so much, Maura. I, I really appreciate that. And, I, and uh, I tried to take as careful notes as I could on your uh, on your four steps. <laughs> and, you know, I, I and, you know, I, I think you're you hit the, the nail right on the head, as, as the saying goes. Um, what I would love to ask you about, since we have a couple of minutes here, if I may, is uh, your perspective on how we really kind of build support uh, for that way of thinking, you know, all, all of those four steps. So that, uh, I think the spur and innovation, maybe that's kind of self-evident, but but because people like new technology, but, you know, kind of that whole four step process, because I think is what you've outlined is it's an interconnected system. And so I, I would love to hear your perspective on, you know, how we build the support for it. Well, um, I think that there's lots of work to do, you know, on the ground, working with farmers, working with the, the companies that um, buy our agricultural products and are increasingly understanding that they need to lean into sustainability. But one of the things that um, has really happily surprised me in the last six months is, um, well, let me just say, we, uh, the, we just launched a new strategy um, this the beginning of the year. Um, where we really defined this challenge of protecting oceans and rivers in the face of climate change. And we did some polling to, um, to uh, see where we stood, see where we stood with existing support. And we were really happily surprised. We found that overwhelmingly, Americans already understand that um, protecting the health of our water is essential to addressing climate change. Mm -hmm. um, about 84% of them in our poll. And what was even more heartening and, and even more heartening for understanding how to work with agriculture is that that wasn't a partisan um, result. They found that that was across the board, Democrats, independents, and Republicans. So um, we think that the seeds are there and that what we need to do is um, help reduce some of the barriers to yeah. move along. And that's why we talk about the policy piece so much. And we think about why we have a system that doesn't already reward farmers for making, for doing the right thing, mm -hmm. protecting our soil and our water. Yeah. But I'm wondering what you think. Yeah. Um, where do you think farmers are on this way of thinking? And do you see yeah. opportunities to build support? Yeah, I, I well, thank you for that. It, yeah, I'll try to real briefly answer that too, is you know, I, I see more and more farmers uh, really recognizing that, you know, because of the drought they're experiencing, the heavy rain they're experiencing, they realize things have to change. And, uh, and they are seeing more and more of their neighbors adopted these soil health management practices. And so uh, there's just greater and greater interest in it. But I also have to admit, when you look at statistics, you see only, you know, about 5% of cropland totally. cover crops, one of the kind of the entry level soil health practices. 
And so we definitely have a long way to go, but I think that uh, more and more of them are in tune with it. I really do feel like that to achieve that, what's important is do exactly what you described is bring people to the table. Uh, mm-hmm. Don't, don't preach from a, from the on high, but s- instead engage and find out what their issues are, their local, you know, their barriers are like you, as you described uh, and engage them in the problem solving process. And yeah. so, yeah. Well, More listen, power we, to you, Wayne. That's we, awesome. Uh, I think we, we have to move on. I'm so sorry. I'd love to continue this on, but we have a lot to go through. But thank you so much, Maura. We really appreciate you uh, visiting with us today. Thank you, Wayne. I enjoyed it.